subject uh, uh, industrial economics. But uh, now, uh, this afternoon's session begins, and uh, our first speaker is Professor Rüger, and he is uh, lecturer. Structures and stability of a magnetic solar tacolan. Floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I shall start with the after some talk, after some historical <laughs> outlines. <laughs> my uh, let me say, my international life in science started when Eka came to Potsdam. Krause had a good friend, this was Robert, and after that, when he came to Boston, we had common interests. This is maybe metaphor. Meta and you arranged me a bicycle. This is true, more, yeah. several. <laughs> <laughs> he, he organized the whiskey, and I organized the music and the fighting. <laughs> Later, I learned that he bought the whiskey in the plane. <laughs> I believed it was a big organization. So, <laughs> 83, <laughs> Professor Krause organized the first international meeting in Potsdam. And one of the, yeah. <laughs> look here, very close together. Came and but this was not the beginning. I believe the beginning was 81. But uh, this conference was a big event in Potsdam. See here, Axel is not even existing. This is, is prehistoric. In some sense, it is prehistoric dynamo. Dynamo Nestor and Sentien, Tupac, already, already died. And. Who's this? You know. It's Esa. From, from her to you. No. Okay, they are too young. <laughs> 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 huh? Yeah, they are not Yeah, they are But they are not from. But they are not from. But they are not Okay, the next. <laughs> the next was. This was. Uh, stellar and planetary magnetic fields. And then we got these. In, uh, the, we got the uh, observations by the. Uh, one group, radio astronomy, and uh, magnetic fields in galaxies has been organized, and this was the first time that I met Axel, here the hidden guy, organizing the next calculations, probably. <laughs> and Shukurov, uh, uh, Redler, Bowser, Wilibinski. Yeah. This was when we believed that it is easy to understand that magnetic fields in galaxies are non exosymmetric It was a big, uh, exciting situation. Uh, a lot of non exosymmetric solutions have been produced, but in the moment, only one of the examples from the observation remained as non exosymmetric The main mean field uh, magnetic fields observed in galaxies are exosymmetric. So this was a... <laughs> It was a it was a highlight, but not but not very not very persistent. Um, this is this paper now eighty six. Uh, of course, uh, Axel opened up me and others the possibility to publish yes, to publish in astronomy and astrophysics. This was not allowed for people from East Germany. Look here. This is uh, look here. This is interesting. Uh, who opened? GDR, GDR, German Democratic Republic. Three times the name was <laughs> three times in the, in the address. This was typical for this type. And we tried to understand the torsional uh, 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 the observations by uh, you said you told it in the morning. Uh, torsional observations. We tried to understand uh, to in. Huh? Yeah, that's how I want to hear. Uh, to understand uh, these torsional oscillations simply by a 
a migrating wave of Lorentz force towards the equators on the basis of the simple dynamo theory in, in this time. And here, first computer, computer design at this time. And we believed, uh, it was a, it, uh, we believed that we can explain it in principle, but then it uh, escaped. <laughs> this is my life. <laughs> this case, uh, we, we got problems with the theory. The first one is that if one computes the influence of the Maxwell stress the by the fluctuations, it even dominates the influence of the Lorentz force. So that even the sign of the Lorentz force was not quite clear. And the other problem was, of course, um, uh, the dynamo. The dynamo model was very, was very simple and uh, with an artificial, or, uh, with an artificial, made with an artificial, simple uh, differential rotation. So that is the reason that there is no number two. We had principal problems. But what I wanted, to, I want to demonstrate today is we, the next, or now we have a, or, or the, the, no, uh, the Tachoglein theory is very close to this paper, except that it is not in the convection zone. It is in a stable stratified region. But the, the idea that the uh, differential rotation produces strong toroidal fields, and together with the polaroidal fields, the BR, B5 negative and, uh, and, 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 and transports angular momentum, and uh, influences the differential rotation. This is the present day magnetic theory of the Tarot line I want to demonstrate now. Negative? Yeah, we find negative. Yeah. Then it is outwards. The minus. Uh, the highlight of this time was the Helsinki conference. Uh, ICA organized this IOA, IAU Colloquium 130. Unfortunately, we do not have photos from this. That's unbelievable. It was my first in the, uh, conference house upload. Mm -hmm. uh, the local organizing committee very small. <laughs> yeah. <No problem>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was very small. Nobody had a front camera. <laughs> so this is a this is a later this is a later portrait uh, after the conference uh, in '92 or '93 in Potsdam. Yeah, '92. Uh, then we switched from whiskey to wine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is typical for the uh, for the end of the nineties. Everybody switched in our age from whiskey to wine. <laughs> okay, and of thirty-five participants. It was for me. It was it was a huge, and very very exciting conference. Look at the title. The title was already the focus. Sun and cool stars. Activity mechanism. Dynamo. Okay, now to the now to the solar uh, We have been interested in the in the older times only to to understand uh, the findings of the Euler seismology of the differential rotation. We could do we could do with the theory of the or with the lambda effect theory. One can indeed. Uh, it is not a, not so easy as we believed 30 years ago, but uh, one can indeed find the equatorial. One can indeed find the Equatorial uh, <coughs> acceleration, middle latitudes, and polar. This strong, this strong gradient here is also in this. Uh, a, a modification of the theory also explains the outer negative shear. But what the, uh, what the hydrogen, this is a hydrogen, a hydro, completely hydrodynamic theory, can not explain, you see it here, this phenomenon of the Tarot line. The Tarot line means the or the, yeah, the Tarot line means that the differential rotation at the base of the convection zone very, very fast decreases to zero in 30,000 kilometers. This is not easy to understand. This is a, a simulation without magnetic fields. We believe, we believe that one can explain this sharp transition from differential rotation to rigid rotation to rigid rotation to rigid rotation by the influence of the magnetic fields, very similar to this first paper with Ilka, or this main paper with Ilka, 
where the Maxwell stress. But now we have no convection, no problem with the fluctuating Maxwell stress. We have only the Maxwell stress. Uh, so look here. This is the uh, this is the uh, uh, rotational profile. This cosine is four. This is important for the next uh, transparency, including the. Uh, and what we use, and what we use is, uh, we need, of course, we need in order to make it uh, make uh, to produce the theory, we need uh, the uh, exact profile. We need this. This is from this representation to this representation. The only paper we found, ninety nine was by Carbon Charbonneau, Dick Paddy and Gilman. Please correct me, Sasha, if you have better. I, I asked you two years ago, we need we need the, <laughs> the differential rotation within the Tacho line. And this is interesting, this is very interesting here. The, the, the cosine is square, of course, once at the base of the convection zone to the end of the Tacho line, 30,000 kilometers, uh, to zero. But this uh, the cosine is fourth term is always zero in the top of life. So that's what we know, and that's what we have to explain. I don't know, is it correct or not? Is it, it is 10 years old. We need new data. We need new uh, statements about this. Uh, this is a very clear <coughs> statement here. This goes to zero. This is the definition of top of life. But this is zero at the end of the whole. It is, it's 30, over 30,000 kilometers. That's the, the cosine is four terms. It exists in the, in the convection zone. But it does not exist after this data. It does not exist. But everything vanishes. I mean, <coughs> it goes on square term. No? It also vanishes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's the definition of the double line. Yeah. 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 So but the, the, uh, the, co the cosine is four term is zero from the beginning. Oh, I see. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised you assume there's no turbulence in the line. Yeah, wait. <laughs> this is my, my clock. Now I switch to a paper which will excuse me? Gingbar, why don't you do this your Gingbar polynomials? One orthogonal intercept for the yes. Yeah. Of course one can do. Uh, now I switch to the a paper which appeared in the early eighties, which we many of us ignored by Watson. He made a, a, a instability analysis in a uh, in a spherical geometry and uh, with a shear, with a differential rotation which only had a, a latitude and rotation. And uh, the scales in this was infinity. There was no radial <coughs> scale. But nevertheless, it is a very interesting paper. And what he found is, what we found is that uh, this, this Watson limit is 0.28 for the A for the uh, uh, cosine square coefficient. If the shear is stronger than 30% or 28%, then it must be unstable, hydrodynamically, without any magnetic fields. If it is smaller, then it is stable. And in, the, in this paper, in the conclusions, it's written that, aha, uh -huh, this, is, this, is uh, this is the explanation for the solar differential rotation. It is, at the, at the surface, it is 28 so it cannot be stronger, the shear cannot be stronger than 28%, uh, 28% otherwise it becomes unstable. But the theory was very simple. It was for infinite, it was for infinite uh, scales. That means it is a, uh, it is a, yeah, there was no, no dependent on the radius scale, on the radius. And we repeated, we repeated the Watson problem Leonid and myself, Leonid Kitschatinov, we repeated the Watson uh, problem in, in, a, in a better approximation. In a better approximation, in order to see how strong is the statement. 28% is the maximum for the differential rotation in the star. And would sine of n square negative? Positive. Well, it's stable. It's stable. It's stable. It's stable. So here's the theory uh, with, uh, with thermal diffusion, G, with viscosity, not, not yet magnetic fields. The Prandtl number is very small. That means the thermal diffusion dominates, in, in, of course, the star it dominates. Here we have this ratio between the buoyancy frequency and the, and the rotation. It is always exceeding 100. This is at the, at, at the base of the convection zone at 400 and more inside the star at 500. 
So we have large scale, large numbers, and we have small numbers. Not easy to uh, to, it's not easy to compute, but of course it's possible. And this was already in the Watson paper. He already compute. He already considered non-exosymmetric uh, disturbances. We are in a non-exosymmetric uh, regime. So and we. Uh, what here, here, we, here is the, the, the wavelengths. This is new. The Watson, is, uh, the Watson uh, theory is on this side, this limit for infinity, and here are the 28%. And what we find with real radial scales, it's a much better theory. It is global in the sphere and local in the radius, but consequent, completely consequent. And what we find is there is an asym <coughs> non -exism, uh, asymmetric instability with n equal 1, non exosymmetric. And the Watson limit for the improved theory is now 21%. 21%. 21% is okay. 21% is marginal. 21% is okay. Uh, the wavelength of the most unstable disturbance is 2,000 kilometers in this type of line. There are no boundary conditions in this, uh, this double line is not well defined. It is no boundary conditions. It's local in R, it's global completely in M and in theta and so on. Uh, the convection zone, at the same time, this is the theory, a theory of R modes. And what we find is the convection zone itself is stable against the, uh, against the excitation of non exosymmetric excitation of non exosymmetric perturbations in hydrodynamics. Convection zone is stable, it's <laughs> here stable, here stable. And the Tahoe line still with 21% is also stable. Here, the, here we have the observation. It was 0.1. At the base of the convection zone, we have only 0.1. Open. So if we now include into the theory, this is the next step beyond the, the original Watson paper, the inclusion of the radial scale and the inclusion of the higher, uh, this f is this, this, uh, the cosine is 4 in the, in the, in the, in the, in the law. He, he only worked with cosine is square, square, theta. And we, of course, also included the f up to 0.5, and we indeed find that it has a strong influence. It again reduces, this is the Watson, the Watson 28%, this is our new result, 21%. And with inclusion of fourth order in, in cosine this theta, here we have only uh, what is that? Eighteen percent, seventeen percent. Oh, it's incre decreasing, 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 but still stable. Oh, very fun. What's the what's the solution? This is the look here. This is the normalized flow rate. 0 0.001, ten to minus three, ten to minus two. The growth rates are very, for this instability, are very, very low. That means the growth times are very long, thousand years. In what year is this term? That is the fusion time, what is it? The fusion time? No. The growth rate is normalized here with the omega. Oh, okay. In rotations. Okay. Thousand rotations. Mm -hmm. This is typical for the instabilities about, uh, in this talk. So, now we, that's it. That's what we can improve, uh, what we can do to improve the Watson hydrodynamic instability. But what about magnetic fields? We must explain the existence of the tuple line. This is not an explanation. This is only an instability of the of the, of the of the of the given rotation law. But we must explain uh, the rotation law between the tuple line. So. Then let's go. We start with a fossil field. A fossil field is in, uh, of, a, of a small, uh, a weak fossil field inside the radiative core of the sun. It's a dipole. And one can really, in the, this is a paper of uh, 96 or so, 97. We started in the introduction with a simple, with a simple example. But already the simple example, it has been called Hartmann layer. In the, after this, but it is not really a Hartmann layer. We have here a different a shear, <coughs> a shear in x direction and in y direction there is the gradient, and we have a latitudinal magnetic field. What happens? Shearing, of course, and the production of toroidal fields. 
and both together, the, uh, the, the original field and the, uh, and the induced toroidal field exert a Lorentz force, so here, the, 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 which changes, which influences, which modifies here the shear. And the, uh, the thickness where this shear of a given amount is reduced by a factor of E exponential. Is, this is a famous, uh, or this is a very, nice, very, very interesting equation. It only depends on the B0. Delta R divided by R is uh, square root of Hartmann number reverse. We can, if the Tahoe line has a thickness of 30,000 kilometers, and, and the radius is 500,000 kilometers of the solar core, then we immediately can conclude that this Hartmann number, in order to produce a real Tahoe line, must be 1,000. <laughs> Look here. Here are the definitions of my, my numbers. The Hartmann number is the B0 itself. The Brundle number you know, the magnetic Brundle number, the Reynolds number, this is the uh, Hartmann number 1,000 means, <coughs> this is the only definition, 10 to minus 6 times square root of nu eta. Here are the nu and the eta. In the not the convection zone, in the top of line and beneath, it is thousand and this is ten. <coughs> the square root is ten to four, also ten to minus six is uh, the B zero is ten to minus four. We only need ten to minus four Gauss in order to produce a very thin tarot line in the magnetic theory. It's only ten to minus four Gauss. <coughs> if we would work in a turbulent tarot line then it is much higher, then we would need 1,000 Gauss for the poloidal field. There are no 1,000 Gauss. But again, I believe one can exclude the idea of Petroy and others that, the, uh, that the, it works in a turbulent tarot line. You can produce the, 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 a, a little laminar tarot line with the microscopic values with a delta minus 4 Gauss, this is a trivial equation here, B phi to B zero. This is the induced B phi. Look here, one can estimate our M is 10 to 9. The Hartmann number was 1,000. That means this is 10 to 6. We have, we need, or we, we find, we find that the, uh, that the 10 to minus 4 Gauss, that the 10 to minus 4 Gauss are amplified to 10 to 200 Gauss by a factor of 6. Yeah? This is 10 to 9, this is 10 to 3, then this is 10 to 6. B phi over B zero. So typical for the magnetic theory of the solar tarot line or well is of a poloidal field of 10 to minus 4 Gauss and 200 Gauss for the toroidal field. Six orders of magnitudes. Of course, the eta is small. That's the reason. The eta is small. 10 to, 10 to 3, and 10, 10 to 13, I believe. Yeah. Question. Uh, where is the Yeah, OK. Yeah, thank you. So, but, of course, it was a discussion by, uh, in the community, of course, uh, this, uh, this, this polar field must be confined in the radiation zone. It's not allowed that these this field lines cross the surface of the tarot line. We can do it with meridional flow, with diamagnetic pumping. It is now, it is that this discussion is now over, I believe. Uh, but, the question is, we are in a high, we are in a radiative zone, we are not in a turbulent area. Are the 200 Gauss stable? Yeah? Uh, hydrodynamically, this, um, the, 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 the tarot line is stable. But what about MHD? What about an MHD? We must compute, we must check, we must plug the 200 Gauss against the instability. And look here at the numbers. They are very, uh, not very good. 10 to minus 6 is the bundle number. Bundle no the magnetic bundle number is 10 to minus 3. It is not possible, in the moment, it is not possible to produce a numerical simulation, a nonlinear simulation with this. We must proceed, we must proceed uh, with uh, linear, or I, I shall proceed with linear. We have a density stratification, it is not antiphatic, it is not isotherm, G is the largest uh, diffusion, this is the thermal diffusion, this is the magnetic diffusion, this is the viscosity, and we have a, a, a we have a dipolar ge uh, field geometry, global in shells, local in radius, and we are looking for an equal one, non excess metallic instability. We do it with the same method as this Watson improvement of the Watson paper, global in shell and uh, local in, in radius. 
Okay, this leads to the so-called um, Taylor instability. Taylor instability just means we have here, this is a Taylor project flow, we have, this is a hydrodynamic Taylor project flow example. Here, is a, here, are, here are currents. Uh, this is inner radius, uh, inner cylinder, this is outer cylinder, here stallium, in the experiment here stallium. We are considering the stability of the azimuthal field, of the azimuthal field. Uh, nobody, or uh, there was a statement that this Taylor instability is neither, is neither, uh, or we do not know, does it exist in, by observation, does it exist in simulation. Here we have a simulation. We have a simulation if, the, if, the, if there is a current and the current is, big and is strong enough, then we find here this is a non axisymmetric instability, this is PR, this is PI. Unfortunately, I have no time to go more in detail, but I, go, I must go in detail. Taylor instability, a non axisymmetric instability in stars, what we find with the same method uh, as in this hydrodynamic approach, uh, we find that there is a minimum a minimum wavelength, this is the wavelength, uh, for symmetric m equal 1 instabilities uh, at uh, omega a, I forgot the uh, omega a is, is, is the magnetic field of 0 0.006, that means 0 0.006 means 600 gauss of the marginal is unstable. Our 200 gauss are still stable. This uh, magnetic explanation of the existence of the solar paraglide has no problem with the instability of the fields. The radial scale again is only 1000 kilometers, but the growth rates, the growth rates are here. The growth rates in this minimum, the growth rates in this minimum are for 600 gauss are 10,000 years. We are speaking about very slow, very slow instability, it's not instability. Okay, this is the result. 600,000 is, is our, look here, it is a, not the easy, it is not the easy uh, theory. Uh, the buoyancy is acting, the rotation is acting, and, uh, the, uh, here, and the magnetic fields are interacting. So look here, this is uh, the growth rate system for various, for various thermal instabilities. Uh, what we found is that one, for the, in the solar case, one can even neglect the stratification, one can even neglect the stratification. So strong is the is this, uh, diffusion. Okay, now next step, next step is we uh, we shall we shall in, we, 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 this was for Richard rotation. What about if we include differential rotation? One has an idea, one has a hope. Differential rotation and non exosymmetric disturbances are fighting each other. So that it should be the case that the differential rotation in the tower climb even stabilizes the magnetic field, the total the magnetic field. And this is true, look here. Super rotation, this is here, and sub rotation, the negative shear and positive shear, both are stabilizing uh, a dipole field uh, by a factor of six. By a factor of six or more. So we have 600 gauss times 6, 3,600 gauss should be un, should be stable in the solar paraglide. This was a very very important result. And mixing my stuff. Uh, the next is uh, very important is this rotational, the rotational stabilizing of the instability. That means if the star is too old, then the rotation is so very slow, then the 600 gauss become unstable. So our prediction is old stars with rotation below two months, slower than two months, should should not have a magnetic instability, uh, should not have a power So, now, I, uh, is it possible to replace the fossil field by a dynamo model? To, uh, to produce this fossil field by, uh, by a dynamo model in the radiative core? This has to do with, this, uh, with the discussion about the table. How the dynamo, we, our questions with the linear theory is what about the alpha, does the alpha effect exist with growth rates of 10,000 years? Is the U dash small enough? The U dash, the, 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 the flow cannot be too, the flow cannot be too uh, fast as otherwise the lithium would be transported and burned and we have no lithium at the solar surface. I must cancel the discussion of this. 
And is it possible with a dynamo to produce a difference of P phi and P0 by six orders of magnitude? The only, I cannot answer the questions, I can only answer the question for the alpha effect. There is indeed an alpha effect in this Taylor instrument idea, uh, but this alpha effect is only is concentrated only to the poles. At the equator, up to 50 degrees, there's nothing. And this alpha effect is way omega over n is 1 over 300 or more, and this is u dash. So in all the simulations we have in convection zones for the alpha effect, uh, this is unity, and we have alpha as of the order of u dash or 0.1, 10% or so. But here it is Romil and, and smaller, 10 to minus 4. It's 10 to minus 4. So in the next meeting I shall tell you is it possible to produce a dynamo with such a with such an alpha effect? I don't know. Probably not. Uh, but it is not excluded. I cannot. Ah, it is negative at the north. Look here, negative at the north. This is for sure. We can uh, we can find the sign. We cannot find the amplitude, but can, we can find the sign. So both are waiting for this answer. <laughs> <laughs> Now, one class is replaced by four classes. <laughs> I believe this is my class, this is my head. Probably this was my class, it was in Catania when we had this conference about experiments. Okay, summary Tacho clients are hydrodynamically stable. The solar Tacho client is even stable in MHD, 600 Gauss and 200 Gauss. If the star is old and the rotation is slowed down, it's been down, then they should be unstable in MHD, no tachocline possible. Uh, tachocline dynamo probably is unliking, unlikely, but this is question mark. Uh, and my last, and my last and most important remark here is Taylor instability is non-accessible with n equal one and introduces a second time scale in the theory. The motivation to do it originally was is it possible to explain the flip-flop phenomenon? And so I must know, does it exist or not? And the discussion this morning was this phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Um, one very short question. Ah. Uh, who was first? Maybe. <laughs> I wonder if, um, you know, my paper with Zimbowski was the stability of Tachet line. And uh, what's important to include in differential rotation in Watson paper is only quadratic term. But when into further terms in differential rotation, you know, that, uh, you know this um, power four, that makes it more stable, economic and stable. I, 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 I think you. I told you about our paper a long time ago. I don't know why you yeah, wanted to. This and uh, it, 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 it destabilizes. And another mistake that no, you no, make... No, 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 it destabilizes. No, it makes more stable. If you make a you know, differential rotation, take only the first term differential rotation. No, it's not true here. <coughs> take only quadratic term. No, 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 no. In the magnetic theory. No, 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 no. theory. Yeah, this, okay. is the, this, this is the uh, fourth order term. And it is the no, no, that's, uh, the, sh the, uh, the functional form of differential rotation is incorrect that you use. What? So differential rotation what? is uh, at least three terms of sum. Yeah. This is the yeah, but you didn't use this in... Uh, I used it. No. This was one of the... But then it was done by Jambowski and, you know, myself, you know, a long time ago. Congratulations. Uh, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> 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 okay, next time I show... This was only the observation here, yeah. But I, uh, I know this paper, yes, yes I know this paper, but... You know, the sun definition of the uh, And that's, you know, the, the last term that makes them stable. I don't uh, I, I think it's something... No. This, this, is, is, this, this is the highest value we considered, and look here, a single for 20 parameters. Do you find hmm. agreement with uh, that theory at all? At any and also, that, uh, it's another mistake that you make that n squared goes with zero in the line. You assume that n squared is much greater than omega squared, but it's not true in the basic connection zone. Then no, not in the connection zone. n squared is zero, the, right? And then it becomes negative. This is not the overshoot ratio. It's below. 
scandal and because Ilka thought I was part of the scandal which I wasn't he recruited me <laughs> <laughs> if you want more details about the scandal I can tell after the talk <laughs> um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, how to detect stellar differential rotation from photometry and spectroscopy and I'm sorry to say that this is not a very constructive talk and uh, the results are very uh, contradictory and uh, I will mainly criticize what other people have done but also what I self, myself have done the problem is that it's very hard to, to do this work at present uh, if you look on solar differential rotation the classical way to detect it is to trace sunspots and then when you have us in here 36 or almost 37,000 sunspots then you can calculate the differential rotation curve. So basically this is what we want to try to do also for stars but uh, as you sure can understand we won't have 37,000 spots from a single star so that's probably where the problem comes from. Um, there are several methods which have been used to detect, to try to detect stellar differential rotation. Uh, one is to use uh, time series analysis of either uh, photometry or, or calcium H and K fluxes and to study changes in the rotation periods. Uh, then of course you can also do direct modeling of star spots using photometry. I won't go into detail but maybe the most promising results I've seen is are from the most satellite where they have more or less continuous flight curves and very high precision flight curves and, and, and they uh, use this to do uh, direct modeling of the star, uh, star spots but there are a lot of problems involved in that uh, some of you may know that if you use photometry it's very hard to get the latitude information uh, in the model uh, then you can use the line profiles the form of the line profiles uh, photospheric absorption lines uh, then you can use Doppler imaging and then you can combine try to combine all three of these methods uh, to use the uh, period analysis, Doppler imaging and even involve the form of the absorption line profiles. Uh, if you use uh, period analysis um, then of course uh, uh, the idea is that uh, if you detect uh, a photometric period which is varying then this can be due to differential rotation in the sense that if uh, the latitude location of the main spot changes uh, then uh, the rotation period of the spot will also change if you have different surface differential rotation and then you can see changes in if you see changes in the photometric period this might be a sign of, of differential rotation and uh, what we in general have done in, in Helsinki is to use the method 
to come up by yet so and belt uh, or three stage period analysis where you uh, use as a model a uh, truncated Fourier series and then you can from using this model derive the, the period, the amplitude and the mean magnitude and the photometric minima of, of the light curve. And uh, if you then take the period and you see variations in it, you can parameterize these variations. Uh, generally, this kind of formula is used where you have a weighted mean of the period and then you have the standard deviation. And from this, you take a sort of three sigma uh, part of these variations and mark it with zeta, and this zeta will be an estimate, an underestimate uh, for the differential rotation rate. And if you uh, want to derive the full differential rotation rate, then you would need uh, information about the latitudes, which I marked here with this symbol, uh, the minimum and maximum latitudes corresponding to the minimum and maximum period variations. Uh, this work is you can find in a paper where also in place co author by Yetsu, where uh, it's an FK comma type star HD191178. And here you can see the period uh, retrieved from, from uh, <coughs> time series analysis. And, and then these uh, vertical lines mark then the area which you use to derive this theta. And for this star, the result was that uh, the uh, lower limit of the differential rotation would correspond to 7.5%, which is quite large, of course. It's larger than expected for a very rapid rotating star. This is a star which, uh, eta comma type star, which rotates uh, uh, with a period of about uh, three days. So, uh, and, and it's a uh, Subgiant, so it's a uh, very fast rotator. This is a more recent work. It's one of my students who made an analysis of um, solar, young solar analog, and got the theta almost of 15% from, from uh, the variations in the periods, which is shown in this picture. Again, you could say that this is much larger than expected because this star rotates about uh, three times faster than the sun, and it's at, uh, about the uh, solar size, a bit smaller. Uh, you can of course question whether the variations you see in the period are really a sign of, of differential rotation. And anyway, when you make a period analysis, you will also get the scatter. So there will soon be sort of a, a zero signal which you have to take into account. But uh, this scatter is generally, it can be estimated and it's generally much more than, than, than the measured uh, standard deviation of, of the retrieved periods. And then you can also look for special signs of differential rotation. If there is some sort of relation between, for instance, the amplitude of the light curve and the photometric period, this could be a sign of differential rotation. Think about, for instance, if you take the, the uh, uh, well, any star, of course, the um, amplitude will depend depending on, on, on of the light curve will be depend on on, on the location of uh, the spots. Uh, so, the, uh, because of geometrical effects, of course, the, the biggest amplitude will be when spots are sort of near to the center of the disk. And in, and in this way, you could, if you see a sign, some sort of relation between the period and the amplitude of. Um, the photometric light curve, this can be interpreted as <coughs> a sign of, of differential rotation. <coughs> Another way is also, also if you look on the photometric minimum. If you think that you have a single uh, spot group or, or spots uh, with latitudinal drift, then uh, as the, this uh, active region drifts in latitude, if there is a differential rotation, the differential uh, the, the the photometric period will, will, will change smoothly. And a change in the photometric period 
uh, will be seen as drifts in the photometric minimum if you use a constant photometric period. An example of this kind of drifts you can see in a paper by Yetzu, uh, also with by co-author. This is not a railway, it's more like a monorail. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially if you look at this particular part here, you can see that the photometric minimum first drifts in one direction and then smoothly changes and, and goes again to another direction. Uh, as far as I can understand, well here you also see similar kinds of drifts. It's very hard to understand these kind of drifts uh, without uh, uh, use, uh, uh, implying some sort of differential rotation. And the difference is mono, between one way rail and dual rail is n equals 1 and n equals 2, right? Uh, no, no, it's, uh, it's only, uh, the difference is that in this case you have only a few secondary minima. But uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a question of how you, phases, rotational phases are figures from 0 to 1. And it's a question of how you fold these figures. And in this case he chose to, not to, to fold them, but to uh, let uh, the Faces increase all the way to 12 to 10. Uh, uh, if you want to get this uh, rail picture, then you would take stripes from this and, and move them so that you only get sort of uh, one. If you understand what I mean. Mm. The problem here is that he tried to do this uh, rail system, but it's impossible during the gaps to for this star to see whether. Uh, a particular minimum belongs to to a certain. Uh, I mean, you, you, if you could uh, use a model, uh, it's sort of flip flop model for this star, where you have two active longitudes. You get into an ambiguous situation where, where the time gap is so big, so you cannot say whether a photometric minimum belongs to uh, to either of these uh, active longitudes. So that's why he didn't do it in this The problem is uh, when, uh, I mean, several stars where you see flip-flops, they tend to do the flip-flop when you're not looking. Which is, of course, not very convincing. Then. There are exceptions. There are stars where you actually can see the flip-flops occurring uh, uh, gradually or, or, or suddenly. Mm -hmm. but, but a lot of the stars don't. Uh, referring to, to Pell's talk, they, they do it when you're not looking and, and that makes it statistically quite uncertain. Because you can actually, with very small changes in the period, you can get uh, uh, the picture very nice. <laughs> if you have a big bad gap, uh, very small change in the period, you can, you can shift a, uh, a phase with 0 0.5 or even one period easily. So, so that's why, uh, that's a problem for, but I, I'm not saying that, I mean, there are certainly stars where where, where, where the flip flops are, where you actually can see them. So, so it's not a, a general comment that they don't exist. Uh, then, if you go to line profiles, uh, um, if you have a differential rotation, in particular if, if it's significant, you will see an influence on the line profiles. And uh, this can be demonstrated by, by this figure. Uh, where you have, a, it's from a paper by Reiners and Schmidt, where you have the spectral observations, and then you have a, a, the line profile for a um, rigid body rotation with the dashed curve. And uh, in this case, the observations are uh, indicating a solar type of differential rotation, which will mean that, sorry, that the line profile uh, rotational line profile becomes sharper. It's deeper in the center, and and the, the wings are uh, uh, in the wings. There is a deficit of the line profile. So if you have a very sharp line profile, this could be sign of differential solar like differential rotation. And if you would have a more shallow bottom line profile, uh, that that could be the cause of, of an anti-solar rotation if, if such exists. Uh, this method uh, is uh, usually done by, by uh, Fourier analysis of the spectrum 
it's very hard to do it if you have spots because the spots make it more complicated. Uh, the line profiles we change because of spots, and, and that's why it's not. Uh, it's usually done for for uh, um, stars uh, of uh, not the latest types, F-type stars. In general, how do you distinguish between solar and anti solar lacking? Do you miss that? If it would be in a solar-like situation, you have a sharper profile, more deep in the center. Uh -huh. And if you have an anti-solar-like, then you would have a bit more shallow in the center. Okay. And, and bro a little bit more broader in the wings. Because of the rotational curve. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's getting more triangular. Yes. Right? Yes. <coughs> yes. <coughs> and more flat bottom for the anti -solar. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, then a lot of work has been done to retrieve differential rotation from uh, Doppler images. And then the idea is that you can either locate uh, individual spots time separated from time-separated Doppler images and study their longitudinal uh, uh, migration. This was first done, I think, by Wacht in a paper, which is actually a very bad example in the sense that they uh, fit a curve with two mm -hmm. parameters to three points. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, later results are, are probably better. And then a uh, very much used method it, uh, is that you cross correlate consecutive Doppler images and you sort of let uh, latitude drift in, in, in the correlation and then you, uh, from that, you can calculate the differential rotation curve. And a third method is that you include the differential rotation as a parameter in Doppler imaging solution, which means that uh, already the map which you, uh, the inversion map is not uh, something which is uh, sort of the same for, for every spectrum, but, but you let the differential rotation shear work during the uh, uh, observed spectral set. Uh, I think all of these involve serious problems, and the serious problems come from that uh, you have always, well, in general, there are always uh, artifacts in the Doppler imaging, uh, images. In a perfect world, there would be no artifacts, but in, in, in a true world, there often are, are such artifacts. And just to show what I mean, I hope I'm not offending anybody. Uh, this is a paper which I uh, where, where you have uh, Doppler Im images of uh, the binary stars, both components. And especially when you look on the magnetic field map, <coughs> you see these stripes going along these maps. And uh, these are, I'm not saying that they don't exist here but they are very common in uh, artifacts in Doppler imaging if you have insufficient data. And uh, uh, it's uh, just a question of that the way the Doppler imaging works is that if you have uh, some uh, systematic errors or you have noise in the uh, observations, uh, uh, the inversion, uh, if you don't do it very carefully, can include this uh, erroneous information in the map and uh, the stripes arise uh, and uh, typically stripes where you also have some high contrast features arise from the fact that this is a way for the inversion procedure to correct to, 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 to the uh, observations also these kind of features where you have strong uh, uh, contrasts very near to each other are common as artifacts, in the sense that uh, they sort of will cancel each other out in all other phases except uh, uh, maybe some phases, phases where, where you have some, some error in the observations. Or. And of course, if you use such a map and include these stripes in the cross-correlation or any kind of uh, calculation of the uh, differential rotation, you will naturally get a differential rotation which is very close to rigid body because uh, the sort of stripes are, are, are not changing in, in, in the consecutive maps, they are always sort of vertical. So that, that's a huge problem if you are using 
Doppler images uh, and, and just to do, do, do cross correlation. Other kinds of, this is from my own work, typical um, artifacts are these shadows of a high latitude feature at a lower latitude. You see them in almost every image in this case. Again, if you uh, use both of these uh, and calculate the, uh, the differential rotation, then of course you again will get the same problem that uh, since these are, these are on different latitude, but they always follow each other in, in every image, uh, you will not get the right differential rotation, you will get the differential rotation which is very close to, to rigid body rotation. So what I would suggest is the best method is to combine the photometry and the spectrometry. Uh, you can take the spot latitudes from Doppler imaging and then you can concentrate on the main spots, not uh, the smaller features. Leave them out completely from the analysis. Retrieve the latitude of the main spot. And this latitude, a spot latitude, should be corresponding to the photometric period of, uh, of that epoch. So we take the photometric period for the same, for, uh, with simultaneous photometry. Then you can include the differential rotation as a stellar parameter in the Doppler imaging version. You can use it to correct the rotation profile. But uh, what I have done is not to use it to correct the surface shear. And uh, the idea is that if you, in a sense, just want to follow the main spot, it doesn't matter if the rest of the <coughs> image is shear. Uh, you, uh, you uh, if you would involve this, then you would make assumptions also about how does the, uh, how, how the surface uh, the, the differential rotation influences the spot. And since you have very big spots on these stars, they will be sheared in, in, in the images if you have strong differential rotation. And, uh, but, but then if you think, uh, does, would this happen in reality if you have a strong magnetic field coming through the photosphere? Uh, will it be able to resist the shear or, or, or will it be sheared? I don't know the answer. But uh, it might not be sheared, even if it's a very big spot. Uh, so this is what I suggest you should do, but then when you do it in practice, uh, you get into some problems. Uh, we have used a lot of uh, observations from the Nordic Optical Telescope to the SOFIN spectrograph. And uh, here is a curve for uh, HD1991718, where you have uh, the latitude of the spots and then the corresponding photometric period for uh, this epoch. And first, at first look, it looks reasonably good. There's some sort of slope here. But of course the problem is that in this case the alpha you get is minus 10%. So it's negative. Uh, Antisolar differential rotation are quite significant. I mean it's uh, much higher. The, the alpha uh, value is much higher than it should be for a fast rotating star and it has this strong sign. Uh, but it is in correspondence with the best fit to the rotation uh, 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 line profiles, which uh, is actually slightly more negative. Again. But the problem you can is illustrated best by, by this picture. We only have very limited latitude range, and we don't know anything about this part. So it's, uh, we have no reason even to believe that the solar rotation curve would be the best fit. But uh, my conclusion is that this is the best way to do it. Uh, maybe we don't need 37,000 points in this case, but ma maybe with already a few tens of points, we, we could actually see whether this is just uh, bad luck that we have gotten a slope here. Uh, statistical significance of this is about, uh, there's a six percentage uh, uh, probability that this is just a random sample and there's no correlation here. And uh, also another problem is that 
the alpha you get from photomet theory is often higher than expected from theoretical models. So both these results are, are a bit contradictory to theoretical models, which say that say that differential representation should be the alpha should be sh small for fast floating stars. Thank you. star has, uh, if you take uh, alpha here, here is, uh, is the sort of percentage uh, that the uh, equator rotates faster than the, the pole. And, uh, and this should not be very high for a fast rotator, as far as I understand the theoretical model. What is the rotation with your anti-solar rotation? What was the rotation, the period of the star? It's 3.3 uh, days. Oh. And the V is 70 mm -hmm. kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, if you have uh, access to Doppler imaging data that uh, spans several rotations, then uh, you can try to incorporate differential rotation in actual Doppler imaging. Yes, yes. And in this case, presumably, you will fit the whole data set. Yes. You want to go. Yes. And of course, uh, if, if, if you know how to operate Doppler imaging, you, you will not get this vertical stripes. That's the yeah. indication of incompetent uh, Doppler imagers. Yes. Uh, uh, but so these shadows, you are, you are uh, the, the shadows is... Uh, the, the dark and bright spots, you mean? No, no, I mean uh, these <coughs> kind of features where you have something which could be real and, and then uh, uh, an artifact. As a, uh, it's a problem when you have a high inclination. Th this you cannot right. avoid. No, that yeah. we cannot avoid, yes. Yeah. Okay, but uh, you agree that this will be probably the most reliable way of uh, effective differential rotation. Uh, you need to observe uh, during some several I, I would concentrate on, uh, I would not use the whole map to in, uh, to fit the differential rotation. But you don't fit in that case. I mean, you, you do fit, but you, you just fit the whole data set. And yeah. the differential rotation is just a parameter. Yeah. As part of the... Yeah. It's the problem is that it's too small. You have just two rotations. It won't say anything. You have to wait uh, ten rotations. Uh, but well, how do you deal with uh, such configuration artifacts uh, in that case? I mean, if you have such artifacts, yeah. My, my, my main point is that you, you shouldn't even use this information with, with, below the equator in a case where you always have it. <coughs> that will probably not affect the modeling of the line profiles. The, the no, no, the, the line profiles will not affect Yeah, yeah that's true. So the point is that you have the data set that spans over several rotations. Okay? Yeah. You try to fit it without differential rotation in the whole set, and it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, so then you allow extra free parameter, which is differential rotation. And if you manage to fit the data set, then you should be happy. You yeah. can say that, well, the image, the only evolution that happened with the surface structure is the shearing by differential rotation. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I feel this is the best way to do it. But will such a huge spot, will it be sheared by differential rotation? Or no, probably not. So you, you will still depend on something which is uh, low latitude. Yeah. Right. 
and uh, the problem is that oh, I'm not saying it will yeah. work for all the stars. Yeah. In order for this spot not to be sheared, it must be and must have been an anti-cyclonic vortex. Mm -hmm. Can you see such a thing possibly? Probably not, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Inside the spot, there must be a higher pressure, for example, it's like this red spot. Uh, yeah, but that's a different story. We can look at molecular lines and, and see if they they have different broadly. How is it possible to measure, to see different rotation if the spot is always at the pole? Uh, it's not at the pole, it's, uh, it's actually located at, uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, latitudes from around 60 to uh, a range of 10 degrees in latitudes. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, center of the spot. Yeah. But the sign is tetra, it's not very different. No, no, that's a problem, and that's why I put this uh, curve here, so you can see that actually it's yeah. uh, very, I mean, you shouldn't make a fit of such a curve with yeah. such a small range of points. But it looks much nicer here, but I don't think you this, to be honest. <laughs> Some small jobs, but material is easy. Promises. We will talk about the foundation project. But, um, but first, we start with the historical uh, background. <laughs> <laughs> and talk the, yeah, about the I mean, foundation. It's uh, I mean, one other side of Lucas uh, activity. <laughs> Activities uh, which was yet yeah, started uh, in um, uh, in late uh, 80s, something 88, right? When we switched from Potsdam to Crimea, correct? 85. 85. When it left Potsdam, right? <laughs> it was evident. Yeah. Anyway, so this is our yeah distinguished scientists here. It's in the lab. No, it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's the cartoon, right? It's a, the uh, Helsinki University uh, guest house and uh, that famous sauna. So we had some discussions. I mean, before the uh, soft inspector was installed, and uh, so what uh, they were talking about, something about very important and how to get uh, something. Um, how to inverse the spectral profiles, how to get this. For oh, buoyancy, I think that was the experiment on buoyancy. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of bubbles in water. Right. So, then, uh, oops. then that was uh, our uh, installation team on the Nordic telescope. Uh, is that pointer? Yeah. So, our engineers from Kamian Observatory, and uh, so we are. Uh, here, our first run was uh, carried out on the, on the telescope floor because uh, the cables which were on it were too short. <laughs> so, sitting in darkness. Um, I mean, basic cables here. And, uh, <coughs> and the spectrograph was, uh, yeah, here you see, acted on the telescope. And um, so then. Uh, and that is the current state where I saw this picture. So I just want to outline very briefly on the... So it's a shadow spectrograph, which provides three <coughs> resolving power corresponding to 
2, 4, and 10 kilometers per second resolution element. And it has uh, uh, relatively good efficiency. So it's a slate spectrograph mounted in the Cassegrain focus of the 2.5 uh, meter telescope. And um, um, so since it was uh, first used, it was uh, also modified to use the, uh, for, uh, to make the parametric observations. So some part of the spectrograph was modified, like the cross dispersion field, and the, the parametric optic was, uh, optics was installed uh, in the front part of the spectrograph. And so it allows to uh, obtain a circularly polarized spectra as well. It, uh, we can also do linear polarization, and to do that, we need uh, quite good uh, knowledge of the equation parameters of the uh, polarimeter. <coughs> and um, so, the, so it's in operation since uh, 92, officially. And then I was, uh, yeah, tech, I mean, the first, uh, first slide, say, yeah, and the uh, observation started. Uh, uh, and uh, so, I will not basically talk about what the, the, the highlights or results in principle. That would be a good topic. Uh, um, I mean, of the, of the, this uh, long operation of years on the structure graph. But I mean, maybe this is uh, one, one other important result is this uh, uh, synopsis observations of active stars. So this is our favorite uh, thing. So we have a lot of spots here to trace, <laughs> to search for potential mutation. So this is uh, most of the data, most of the Doppler Im images here. They come from Sophie and uh, 92 is somewhere here. But uh, the images obtained earlier was, uh, this image was obtained with MACMAS uh, solar telescope and uh, some observations from Roshan, I think, are also here and for it. Uh, so I think that this is the, the nice uh, outcome <coughs> of this uh, spectrograph. And uh, so now we're using the observing, doing basically the same observations, but already in the polarimetric mode. So all observations are carried out in the, for the circular polarized slide. So that was our kind of first introduction here. And um, uh, so then we make the next step. And um, we'll talk about um, our current project in, uh, in Potsdam, where we are building an instrument, a spectral polarimeter, kind of uh, similar to what we have used uh, or still using for the as a softened spectrograph, because the basic concepts are rather similar. And uh, so, it's uh, so spectrograph for the large binocular telescope in uh, Arizona. So it's two meters, 8.4 meters uh, combined together. Of, uh, give, uh, they uh, give the, the largest collective area at the moment unless we have E and T. So this gives a uh, 12.5 uh, uh, something meters uh, altogether. <coughs> so the light from two telescopes are combined and then it's uh, rendered all fibers to the spectrograph here, which is obtained in the field of the telescope. Um, so we have these uh, three uh, different resolutions. So one kilometer per second, uh, yeah, uh, resolution element and uh, that can be uh, so the spectrum of my pupils so then uh, what are the main features is the that um, so it uses uh, spectrum quite big huge uh, it's got the PLT basically size uh, or scale so it uses uh, almost uh, something one meter long uh, shell grading and uh, then the light cross-dispersed 
was this uh, uh, volumetric play um, tradings, and uh, so then the red or red, red cross dispersed dispersed orders they are recorded. The red optimizes and the blue orders recorded on the blue optimizers. So we have two CCDs. Um, so we have the largest <laughs> shallow grading. Also we have the gigantic uh, 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 10K CCDs. And so we are custom num number two. I mean, this, the, CCD, the CCDs are, uh, are mounted and equipped uh, by Mount uh, Lesser in Arizona. So the, the first custom was the uh, uh, Department of Defense of the US. So we are the second custom. So 10 k CCDs uh, we used for the first time in astronomy. Uh, so the spectrograph will be used in integral modes. So <coughs> the light uh, will be rendered from the Nesmith uh, platform uh, stations to the spectrograph. And it will be used in the volumetric mode with the perimeters here, which are mounted uh, in the uh, rod and focus of the uh, telescope. Um, so then the, the enclosure is well stabilized within this uh, 10 millikelvins and the uh, pressure stabilized at the key point for the uh, stability of the spectrograph. So that's the, the, the spectrograph itself, uh, how it's in the, yeah, in the uh, design screen. Uh, so, uh, so the perimeters here, so as it was seen, so we have two identical configurations and two perimeters. Uh, so we have the so the, the entrance uh, pin hole and uh, then the curvation optics. Everything is in parallel beam. So then uh, we have the science retarder here and Wollaston is the split light and two. So we then see I plus minus V. And then they are going to two fibers. Uh, so if we remove the uh, uh, retarder, so we then uh, able to observe uh, the linear equalization mode. So we can have this Wollaston uh, prism or just I plus minus Q or uh, so the, that's the basic idea here. Um, Almost, yeah. Or, yeah, almost, uh, yeah, materialized. Uh, mm -hmm. and so, and, uh, yeah, important part of the telemetric uh, um, observations is the knowledge of the activation parameters here, what's, what we do for the, uh, to, how to, uh, deriving the, uh, making the equations, so the equation curves are here, and the, all the parameters which uh, we need basically um, so then, an um, important part of the spectrograph, uh, what we have been designed here uh, in Potsdam, is the, uh, the accurate wavelength calibration issue. So we're trying to solve this problem because if we use thorium argon lamps for the wavelength calibration, then we have a lot of problems with the line list and then the um, variation, extremely large variations in the intensity of spectral lines, blending effects, and so on. There's uh, a lot of uh, <coughs> disadvantages there. So we're trying to utilize the, or create uh, the, the, the other alternative is uh, uh, based on the Fabrizio Rode alone. So it's a kind of special design of the Etalon, uh, which would yeah, provide us uh, the internal accuracy up to three centimeters per second. Um, so it's uh, located in, in the sealed uh, cell and uh, some uh, zero uh, thermal expansion uh, glass is used as a space for this uh, etalon. Basically two glasses, uh, two mirror glasses, and the light bouncing back and forth between these two surfaces is uh, transmitted uh, at uh, certain wavelengths uh, depending on the, uh, this uh, 
distance between the glasses. So we get on the shallow spectrum something like this, kind of a picket fence, uh, the transmission profiles of uh, uh, equal intensity and equal distance uh, in the wavelength scale, which of course uh, changes over from the <coughs> So these we use basically then, I mean, the, then the stability of this uh, uh, transmission profiles will be yeah, order of three centimeters per second, given the stability of the temperature uh, uh, limit in the spectrograph, plus uh, given the number of these lines uh, for spectral order and, and how many of these are on the image. Uh, so we also do some internal uh, stability tests, uh, I mean the separate line cells here, which we can monitor whether this is stable or not. Uh, but uh, I say input light, we just use the flat field on, uh, light uh, Continuous light source, and it's this way. Um, so that's uh, one thing, and um, the other, say, important part of the instrument is uh, our we're constructing this uh, solar disk integration, a small binocular telescope, uh, which will be located uh, uh, <coughs> the LBT on the telescope balcony. So we have again two telescopes, so we'll fit two arms of the spectrograph, like I mean, the, the big, uh, two big mirrors. So we will then uh, observe the sun, uh, I mean, all year round, every day, uh, and uh, making this, uh, and, uh, so basically this telescope will produce single spectra per day with uh, uh, 300,000 resolution and signal to noise of uh, 5,000 in the whole spectrum range. So now we are <coughs> envisioned to also do it not only in the integral light, but also in the polarized light, so we can observe the circular polarization, so observe the, the net uh, magnetic field over the, I mean, in a short or long time scale, say over the solar cycle. And that uh, seems to be rather promising thing. <coughs> That's uh, and how this uh, control this telescope. So we see the sun on the video camera. So what is important here, I mean, what, why do you need to see the sun? So we are tracking on the sun, I mean on this image, tracking, uh, guiding uh, on this uh, image of the sun. What is important that uh, if, uh, I mean, if the sun say clouds, or uh, partial uh, obscuration of the sun, then we can get some, some, some excess and some active areas in the sun, so we, need, we can only observe when there's no sun or oh, but when there's no clouds, say. Uh, so that we want to get really good uh, and clean uh, solar disk. Um, so, and that's uh, well, just uh, showing this is kind of an optical diagram for the spectrograph. This is uh, yeah, optical wiring. Uh, so we have so many fibers going here to the spectrograph, to the inner slicers. And uh, they go into this Nesmith platform from uh, and to Nesmith platforms, and to polarimeters, <coughs> and solar telescopes. <coughs> then we have uh, this video. So, like, yeah, this one. And then. <coughs> So it's rather complicated. So we have a number of filtration sources, like, I mean, we still use it, uh, of course, uh, Tori Magan. It's a zero point calibration for the Bripiro, and the Bripiro is also here, goes in this uh, fiber switch. So then, so that's how the, 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 control software looks like and just try to put everything on one screen but it doesn't hit of course uh, so it's, uh, basically that's uh, what we have for software now because now we, because we have for many years we control uh, uh, yeah, software structure from Linux and uh, it looks rather similar to you know, what we have here it's basically it's a kind of copy of modification <coughs> of everything and here our uh, small interface here to the telescope itself so for, per, I mean, polarimeter, so we see this, I mean, left and right polarimeter, so we have uh, two stars uh, uh, split by the Wollaston trees, and they are projected on the fiber, and so we have to make some fine corrections during the integration. And, uh, yeah, 
So that's the basic principle of this, uh, the interfaces. <coughs> so we, yeah, uh, if it's a funny or not, then I'll say it's made in the moment of cutting. Yeah. So we can design them in this nice interface or command line interface, but we never meet with customers, so make it so it will reboot them. <laughs> Every <laughs> so that's uh, <coughs> the next. Okay, this is something you are our pipeline, the basic diagram. So we have some different, uh, I mean, uh, different type of images. So how they are. I mean, this is basically uh, a common thing. So it's important here to do it to the uh, very uh, IP and D uh, structure uh, analysis. And, uh, so about this, uh, very brief, briefly then I have five minutes left. Uh, uh, it's our computer system, which uh, I mean, controls. Uh, so basically, we have done the nighttime operations uh, I mean, when we use the main telescope, and we have day day daytime observation. We use a um, uh, solar telescope, but that's all year round. So we need quite redundant uh, and uh, robust uh, sys computer system, which yeah, we hope to get from Dell. And we have uh, I mean, four servers, I mean, back, everything is back now on here, so we have a control computer and two day production computer, I mean, for day and night uh, time mode, and one uh, carrying or spare, or spare computer. So this, uh, I mean, four servers <coughs> see simultaneously the, the same uh, hard disk space, I mean, of the same rate, so equally they can access the same rate library. So then we have this uh, CCD to CCD uh, computer, control computers, and so then everything we are here is control room, the pin client, or I mean, that's uh, X uh, client, and we use the fiber channels to interconnect between the servers and the storage um, and the thing that goes show. Uh, so, and that's the final part uh, where we principle what started, I mean, the basic um, principle what we are, I mean, trying to get after the, uh, uh, from these observations, I mean, we started with uh, software, now we're doing this uh, Pepsi, and basically what we are, I mean, we're getting from uh, this is that we have some um, uh, cooler spots on the surface of, say, late life star, and uh, so the magnetic flux here emerging, uh, so magnetic vectors are shown, so then the, this, uh, we see, I mean, this integrated, uh, I mean, uh, the velocity resolved uh, uh, spectral lines, in all position states, I mean, the principle, this is a movie, so the, I mean, the start of days, the profile of, uh, changing, and from this, uh, uh, if we have, uh, I mean, the full knowledge, I mean, we have all the post stocks parameters, then the, the unique and principal solution and limited by the noise uh, can be derived. Uh, but uh, yeah, usually that's not the case because we say limited uh, quite often only to the uh, linear position mode. So then we have only some three profiles here, and this information from uh, QMU is missing. Um, so then what we have, the, yeah, the say results from SOFIN is uh, that what we I mean, uh, do now, this uh, uh, again same star which was shown before, I take uh, the, I mean, the circle is polarized profiles, different faces, it's quite smooth, almost no noise because this is uh, the uh, restored profiles after the uh, principal component uh, deconvolution of this profile. And so this information used to derive the magnetic maps of the star, <coughs> so it shows the radio component of the star as a also radio component. And this is just uh, one, one year, I mean one observing time. This was uh, for 2000. And uh, the same, yeah, so before, of course, um, 
render the same maps here. So we see the temperatures spots here with yeah some also stripes, vertical stripes, regional stripes here. And so then the magnetic features here basically. And uh, so what is important because we not only uh, looking for say migration of the temperature spots, potential uh, rotation, so on. what is important, how the magnetic field is uh, evolving in time. That's what we do now. And that's what we're going to do as well with the DPS person. So we see the component of zone four, and then it changed, uh, it's went and it was somewhere here, then it uh, split from in a series of laser. Last slide is this one. So that's what we are basically doing on time. We are calibrating to get reliable. Some technical, I mean, problems imposed to us. I mean, not depending on us. I mean, some companies they delayed uh, in production. I mean, I mean, some unique companies which produce some glass or tin polish. For instance, this like that. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, the real. Maybe it's crisis. We can blame the financial crisis, for instance. But we're talking half a year or a year. Uh, say. <coughs> In the 2012, for something, yeah, we, we have a, we have a plan, we have a schedule, we all stressed, and uh, so. <laughs> Not your what? No, <laughs> <laughs> something, to, yeah, 2012 or so. So, uh, but definitely it will be delayed. Uh, um, we even have no say. Uh, we can spare. We cannot spare time for the shipment of the instrument. Should be done kind of express uh, boat or I mean airplane <coughs> <laughs> or use military airplane. Yes. Yeah. To so so where, to where it is in Potsdam? Yeah, it's constructed in Potsdam. <coughs> um, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And now we have coffee book breaks and uh, back in five minutes.